Thank you, Dr. Chen Claire, for asking me, giving me, allow me the pleasure to introduce our special, very special speaker today, uh, Dr. Elena Nik Nikola Yenko. Um, so I also don't want to take too much time, <laughs> but I do want to take the time to introduce Dr. Nikola Yenko. Um, and she has an illustrious career. Um, she comes um, to Denison today um, as from Fordham University. Um, she's currently a professor of political science at Fordham University. She is also an associate at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. And prior to that, um, as Dr. Nikola Yenko shared with my class today, she has lived in many other parts <laughs> all over. <laughs> Particularly, she received her um, PhD from University of Toronto. And then prior to that, her master uh, in political science at Kansas State University. And then also um, have also spent time uh, going to um, English at the school, I'm gonna not say this correctly, but um, Horlivka um, Institute of Foreign Language in Ukraine. And so she shared with our class that by having lived in many places from, from Canada to Kansas to Ukraine has in many ways um, allowed her to have many different lands. I look at things from different perspectives and various lands. And her book, um, that she will be sharing with us today does precisely that. It takes a comparative perspective of various youth movement um, in Eastern Europe, and um, particularly in five post-communist states during national elections. Um, and furthermore, she continued to um, do work on the cut across various intersection of comparative democratization, social movements, political behaviors, women's activism, and youth, of highly salient issues, um, particularly in contemporary politics and today's context. So without further ado, please uh, give Dr. Elena Nikola Yenko a round of applause. Thank, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, thank you, Do Dr. Claire Jen, uh, for inviting me uh, to be a part of the uh, Laura Harris series, honoring the uh, pioneering work in the medical profession and uh, celebrating women's achievements in undergraduate education. It's a great honor for me to be a part of this series. And uh, thank you for, thank you to Joan for the introduction. Um, and uh, uh, today, we are almost uh, one month away from the midterm elections in the United States. And elections uh, by now have become the near universal phenomenon uh, that we observe uh, around the globe. Uh, but as you can see on this map, uh, produced by the Freedom House, an organization based uh, in New York City, Approximately half of the world uh, today uh, lives in countries uh, that are defined by Freedom House as uh, partly free or not free. Uh, and on this map, these countries are colored in either purple or yellow, signifying that uh, a sizable portion of the world population experiences uh, systematic violations uh, of political rights and civil liberties. And yet, most autocrats in these repressive political regimes continue to maintain a facade of democracy and hold elections on a regular basis. And elections in non-democratic regimes uh, perform several functions. First, elections might provide a mechanism for the maintenance of patronage networks and the distribution of spoils among members of the ruling elite. And second, 
Elections might serve as a device for gathering information about society and in particular detecting pockets of resistance to the regime. And furthermore, autocrats might use elections as a tool to enhance their international reputation and mitigate external pressures for democracy. Yet in the book uh, that I have written, I look at elections as an opportunity for political change. Elections in uh, hybrid regimes falling somewhere between democracy and dictatorship uh, do not, are not fully predetermined. Yeah? Uh, there remains a possibility for political change if a sizable portion of the population votes against the ruling party or against the, the authoritarian incumbent. There is a possibility of uh, elite defections and in particular security defections. And international actors can also uh, exert a great deal of pressure on the incumbent government uh, to uh, provide an opportunity for competitive elections and minimize uh, the extent of electoral fraud. And in particular, young activists, uh, uh, youth activists, uh, uh, young people uh, around the globe uh, can uh, uh, consider elections uh, as a chance uh, to bring about political change. So I'm going to discuss um, in my today's uh, talk how young people uh, in the early 2000s uh, formed youth movements uh, to try and uh, press for political change during national elections uh, in five post-communist regimes, five post-communist countries, Serbia, Belarus, the Republic of Georgia, Ukraine, and Azerbaijan. I just arranged them in the chronological order in which this youth movements emerged. At the turn of the 21st century, there has been a spectacular rise of nonviolent youth movements in Eastern Europe. Young people called for free and fair elections in uh, Serbia. Uh, in uh, 1998, a group of university students uh, at the University of Belgrade uh, was formed. Uh, and uh, in 2000, when the incumbent announced uh, uh, the SNAP elections, uh, they seized an opportunity uh, to mobilize young voters and to uh, demand uh, the turnover of power. And uh, just three months after Milosevic was removed from office, in 2001, uh, the Belarusian uh, youth movement Zubr, which literally means bison, was formed on the eve of the 2001 presidential election in Belarus. Next, uh, in the Republic of Georgia, on the eve of the 2003 parliamentary elections, youth activism set up uh, the uh, social movement named Kumara, enough, suggesting that it's enough to put up with corruption and poverty uh, and stagnation in the country, and it's time to bring about political change. Uh, this tide of youth activism continued uh, with the rise of uh, not just one, but several youth groups youth movements in uh, Ukraine and Azerbaijan. In Ukraine, uh, both of them were named, two, two of these groups were named Para, one of them Black Para, another one Yellow Para, uh, nicknamed this way after the color of the, uh, of the, uh, of the publications. And uh, Para uh, it means uh, it's time uh, in, in Ukrainian. Um, and uh, in uh, the Azerbaijan, uh, Makam, Yenifikir, and Yor were also formed on the eve of the parliamentary elections uh, to demand political change. And uh, a striking feature of all these youth movements was that they formed around the same time. Most of them were formed uh, during the election year, 
Uh, and another common feature of these uh, youth movements was that they primarily focused on the issue of free and fair elections. Uh, and they targeted the incumbent as a stumbling block to democratization. Another common attribute of these youth movements was the use, uh, the creative use of nonviolent methods of resistance. And here on the screen, you can see, for example, some symbols of resistance that these youth movements deployed. Um, Otpor, uh, which means resistance in Serbian, used the symbol of the clenched fist as its logo, and uh, then um, a few years later, when the Georgian youth activists debated um, uh, the logo for their own movement, they uh, just uh, decided to borrow uh, this idea from Otpor and also use the uh, symbol of clenched fist. Yeah, but you can see how the ideas traveled and how they try to. <laughs> Um, modify slightly um, the visuals, so change in the background or the color in which um, the clenched fist was um, uh, depicted on the, on the uh, logo. Uh, and uh, another poster, a set of posters at the bottom just illustrates also how symbolically youth activists in two countries, uh, in Belarus and Ukraine, try to symbolize uh, the commitment to fight against the incumbent government and kind of squash them. <laughs> um, uh, so um, uh, in many ways, uh, these youth movements looked quite uh, similar. Uh, yet, uh, what is uh, interesting about these youth movements is that they did differ in the size of the youth movements, in the level of youth mobilization against the regime. And of course, these statistics uh, might be taken with this great caution uh, because um, uh, there is a lack of reliable data on membership in these youth movements. And in part, it has to do with the fact uh, that uh, these youth movements were formed in repressive political regimes, so they didn't keep a good record of how many people joined. Uh, but according to numerous accounts, uh, there are discernible differences in the size of the youth movement. Uh, and uh, in some countries like Serbia and Ukraine, if we look not at the raw numbers, but as a uh, uh, at the size of the youth movement as a percentage of the youth population, we can see how in uh, Serbia in particular, but uh, also to some extent in Ukraine and in the Republic of Georgia, uh, youth movements were able to attract a significantly larger number of young people than in Azerbaijan and in Belarus. And uh, furthermore, since we're talking about elections, uh, we need to look at uh, the voter turnout and uh, vote choice for a particular candidate. Of course, it's not surprising that uh, during the presidential elections, voter turnout and youth voter turnout in general tends to be higher than during the parliamentary elections. I think we observe the same trends in the United States when more young people turn out during the presidential elections than during the uh, congressional elections or midterm elections. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if we take a closer look at just at vote choice and compare, for example, Serbia uh, and Ukraine uh, to Belarus, we can see how in Serbia, remarkably, uh, E nearly 81% of young people who showed up to the polling stations uh, uh, voted against the incumbent, voted in favor of another political candidate. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, the majority of young voters also cast the ballot uh, in favor of Viktor Yushchenko, a pro-European, kind of pro-Ukrainian uh, candidate uh, running for presidency in 2004. Uh, but in Belarus, uh, the overwhelming majority of young voters cast a ballot for the autocrat. Uh, and only 27% voted for a candidate from a united opposition. So this results, this statistics just suggest how there was variation in the extent 
to which young uh, youth movements in different countries were able to mobilize uh, young voters. Uh, there is also uh, considerable variation in the length of post-election protests and the size of post-election protests. Of course, not just young people participated in these protest events, uh, but they are indicative of broader trends across the countries uh, where, once again, we can see, for example, how in the case of Ukraine, uh, at one point up to one million people comprising approximately one third of the city's population took to the street and you know, flooded the uh, main uh, city square. And the protests lasted uh, uh, for more than two weeks, uh, while in Belarus, uh, uh, at most, 5,000 uh, uh, showed up at post-election protests, uh, uh, and they were able to gather in the capital city of Minsk only for a handful of days. So uh, these uh, statistics uh, suggest that there is some variation in the level of youth mobilization uh, in repressive political regimes. So in the book, uh, I make an argument that uh, tactical interactions between social movements and incumbent governments explain in part the level of youth mobilization against the regime. Uh, tactical interaction is an ongoing process in which insurgents and opponents seek in a chess-like fashion to offset the moves of the other. As defined by Douglas McAdam, tactical interaction consists of two components, tactical innovation by the challenge organization and uh, tactical adaptation by its adversary. On the one hand, the social movement seeks to attain its goals through the deployment of innovative tactics. And on the other hand, the movement's adversary, oftentimes it's the ruling elite, the incumbent government, tries to devise savvy counter-mobilization tactics. So the level of youth mobilization is affected by the extent to which the social movement and the incumbent government deploy innovative tactics and counteract each other's action. And here, innovation does not necessarily mean the generation of absolutely novel ideas. The novelty of protest tactics or state counter moves in a particular context might be sufficient uh, to catch an opponent by surprise and gain a strategic advantage. And furthermore, in the book, I argue that learning is vital to the development of effective tactics. And I distinguish two uh, main learning mechanisms, participation in prior protest campaigns inside the country and the cross-national diffusion of ideas. Uh, the underlying assumption is that both civic activists and uh, the ruling elite can draw lessons from earlier episodes of contention. And the uh, movement participants can devise more effective tactics if they critically assess the dynamics of previous protest campaigns inside and outside the country. Similarly, the incumbent government can deploy more effective counter-mobilization tactics if it takes cues from prior upheavals in politically affinitive uh, contexts. And the pace of learning by civic activists and autocratic incumbents uh, counts to some extent for cross-country differences in state moment interactions. So um, in the uh, book, I distinguish for the three types of movement tactics based upon the target of their action. Uh, recruitment tactics targeted at the youth population, tactics vis-a-vis -vis allies, and tactics vis-a-vis -vis opponents. Recruitment tactics are critical to the political activation of youth because they determine the scope and the methods of the, government's, of the movement's growth. Tactics with the allies also affect the level of youth mobilization because the challenge organization needs to forge alliances with other civil society actors to tip the balance of power in its favor. And furthermore, tactics with the opponents influence the level of youth mobilization because novel forms of civil resistance might draw a larger pool of youngsters into a movement. And by the same token, this study distinguishes different types of uh, state counter moves, 
Uh, state repression is often defined as behavior that is applied by governments in an effort to bring about political quiescence and facilitate the continuity of the regime through some form of restrictions or violation of political and civil liberties. And uh, broadly speaking, this study distinguishes between coercion or state repression, uh, the use of force, and channeling, a subtler form of uh, repression a repressive ac action that is meant to affect the forms of protests available or the timing of protests or flows of uh, resources uh, to the social movement. And in addition, uh, I analyze uh, the extent to which uh, the government provided support for regime-friendly youth organizations as a form of um, state counter rule counter move to try to draw young people away from the engagement in, uh, in uh, protest activities to support for the government. So uh, this research uh, um, defines uh, youth movements as organized and the collective uh, kind of conscious attempts on the part of young people to initiate or resist change in the social order and I treat OTPOR you know, that was formed in Serbia in 1998 as an initiator movement, and then um, compare and contrast how young people in Belarus and Ukraine uh, try to emulate OTPOR's tactics, and also how young people in Azerbaijan and Georgia, the two former Soviet republics in the Caucasus, uh, try to uh, use um, a similar set of tactics uh, to try and uh, demand political change. And my research is based upon a wide range of sources, including uh, media publications, uh, uh, government reports, NGO reports, uh, but most of all, importantly, uh, semi-structured interviews with uh, former youth movement participants. I did some field work in the region where I traveled uh, to all these countries, and uh, um, of course, you know, this research in part is based upon the stories that those um, youth activists tell themselves. Um, and at this point, it's um, nearly impossible to conduct interviews with representatives of the coercive apparatus in these countries. Uh, uh, to this day, Azerbaijan, um, Belarus are uh, ruled by um, autocrats, and even in auto, uh, even in Serbia, uh, where some progress toward democracy was made after Milosevic was removed from power, still a lot of um, uh, police records uh, related to that period are still not um, accessible uh, for for researchers. Uh, nonetheless, even in 2008, nearly um, you know, um, 10 years after Serbia's uh, movement, uh, Otpor was formed, I could still find some remnants of the previous struggle. Uh, and I took a picture in uh, downtown Belgrade uh, of uh, the graffiti where they spray painted the, the, the slogan Gatovia, uh, and uh, you can see an image of the clenched fist. <laughs> um, so it kind of stayed uh, un, uh, untouched uh, uh, almost uh, 10 years after, um, after the movement itself was formed. Uh, and of course, uh, the political climate in Azerbaijan, for example, was very, very different, uh, um, where uh, there was a high level of repression and uh, uh, most recently, uh, you know, the, a lot of youth activists whom I interviewed uh, have um, uh, left the country uh, out of fear of um, imprisonment. So just to uh, make it more specific and to illustrate how exactly young people employed uh, uh, nonviolent methods of resistance and how dis they, they displayed a great deal of creativity, I'm going to focus very briefly and highlight uh, um, the tactics used by the Serbian youth movement Otpor. And then later, during q and I, I would be more than happy to discuss in greater detail how uh, Ukrainian, Georgian, Belarusian, Azerbaijani youth movements uh, try to uh, deploy a similar set of tactics uh, and why some of them were more successful than others. 
so first of all, uh, what is noteworthy about Otpor is uh, that initially when this youth movement was formed, it naturally focused on the issues that are very close to many university students, uh, in particular uh, university autonomy. <laughs> In a repressive political regime, the autocrat often tries to uh, exercise a great deal of control over the appointment of university administration. Uh, uh, and uh, in turn, you know, the university president then um, puts uh, pressure on the faculty and students uh, to stay out of politics uh, to toe the official party line. So initially, university students in Serbia demanded uh, greater autonomy for universities so that they could have a voice in deciding uh, who would be uh, uh, in charge of uh, the university, uh, who would uh, formulate personnel policies and um, policies that directly affect student life. Uh, they were also preoccupied with the issue of press freedom. Uh, but once uh, the incumbent uh, declared that uh, he would run for office again uh, for another term, uh, then uh, they focused just on one issue free and fair elections. Uh, and they adopted a two-track approach to nonviolent resistance. On the one hand, uh, Serbian activists launched the negative campaign titled Gatovia, he's finished. <laughs> so the name itself, I think, is uh, quite, um, uh, quite um, um, so it tells you what uh, they had in mind and how they envisioned uh, the end of this um, election campaign. Um, and in the campaigning, they just uh, blamed uh, Slobodan Milosevic for all the bad things that were happening in the country. Uh, and um, another campaign at the same time uh, was uh, very similar to what we would call a get out the vote campaign. Uh, it was titled Vreme Ye, it's time, suggesting that it's time to act. Uh, it's time to speak up, to take action. Um, uh, so uh, on the one hand, uh, they were trying to expose all the problems in society and uh, blame uh, the incumbent for, for them. But on the other hand, uh, they, want, they didn't want to be just too negative and they also wanted to provide uh, a specific um, course of action that young voters, uh, young people could take to bring about political change. And I think it's a very important uh, um, um, ingredient uh, for their success. They didn't just focus only on the negatives, uh, they also provided some positives for young people. And another very critical um, element of um, uh, Serbia's success was the creation of the culture of resistance. Um, and um, in, uh, uh, and in the uh, remarks uh, uh, when, they re uh, when I spoke with uh, youth activists, uh, they pointed how, uh, out how, for example, they used extensively humor to try and uh, poke fun at the regime. When you're fighting against a brutal force, it's best to put up resistance and make funny jokes to show how stupid the regime is. And the Milosevic regime didn't know how to react to it, said Nina Bisevich, a member of Otpor's press department. Uh, so just to give you a very specific example, uh, when the eclipse occurred in Belgrade in August 1999, Otpor activists uh, used this natural phenomenon to make a political statement. Uh, Otpor members set up a huge cardboard telescope in the street and invited passersby to see the fallen star dubbed the Slobotea. Uh, and the makeshift telescope showed the picture of Milosevic implying his imminent downfall. So it didn't take up a lot of resources to set up this uh, um, kind of um, um, street action, uh, but um, it uh, made a lot of young people, a lot of passersby, laugh at uh, the uh, situation, uh, the political situation in the country. Uh, and. Um, 
In addition to street performances and graffiti, uh, Serbian activists employed rock concerts as a, a tool for voter mobilization. Rock music in general is often associated with the resistance to the regime or revolt against authorities. Uh, and uh, in Serbia, rock music was an alternative to turba folk, uh, the fusion of folk music with pop and dance. Uh, uh, so um, youth activists organized rock uh, concerts uh, at which rock musicians would uh, urge uh, um, young people to uh, uh, go and vote. And uh, um, another critical element of Otpor's model was uh, the cultivation of ties with uh, many influential allies. Uh, so they uh, built uh, connections with non-governmental organizations in Serbia and mass media. Um, another thing that they've done was uh, they pushed for the unity of opposition political parties. Um, it was very important because politicians uh, um, in many post-Soviet countries, for example, were reluctant to unite again, uh, around one candidate to present a united front against uh, the incumbent. Uh, and it took a lot of effort on the part of young people, youth activists, to try to pressure them to maybe give up uh, to some extent their the, the, the political ambitions uh, and uh, unite uh, get around one candidate. Uh, and furthermore, uh, what the Serbian youth did was to also promote uh, a fraternizing approach to the police, where they would treat the police officers not as enemies of, of the movement, but as victims of the regime, so that they would uh, be able to find some common ground with the police, with the coercive apparatus. Uh, and uh, it's also noteworthy that uh, uh, Serbian youth employed marketing uh, techniques, uh, mixed marketing with civil resistance. Um, and uh, one of the activists uh, at that time, um, uh, Nina, uh, Nina Petrovic, for example, uh, Van Maravich, for example, recalled how. Um, to some extent, it reminded him of grassroots marketing, where you would uh, uh, not uh, really uh, protest once a week and then move on with your life as usual, but you turn uh, resistance into your lifestyle. Uh, and it becomes like a constant campaign. Um, uh, and uh, like uh, you market uh, uh, some consumer products, uh, you can also market resistance. So they produce them uh, T-shirts, uh, badges, uh, umbrellas uh, with a symbol of the clenched fist uh, uh, to make it cool for young people to join the movement and to protest against the government. Um, they, for example, appeared in MTV at the time and received an award. Um, and uh, also um, they learned from the uh, previous protest campaigns that were held in, in, in um, Serbia in 1996, 1997, uh, when uh, in the aftermath of uh, the local elections, uh, thousands of people, including many university students, participated in marches against uh, the election, uh, the, uh, against the stolen votes. Uh, um, and what is not worth it, just very briefly about that protest campaign, for example, is that they marched every day for several days, <laughs> several weeks. Um, uh, and uh, one of the uh, youth activists at the time uh, noticed that um, uh, people became bored, they became tired of marching every day. Uh, and uh, they realized that they could not rely just on this particular method of resistance to keep the movement uh, going. And that's why later on when they formed Otpor, uh, they came up with a wide uh, range of nonviolent methods of resistance. Another lesson that they learned from 1996, 1997 was that the social movement, even if it's called the youth movement, needs to build a heterogeneous base of support uh, beyond university students. Um, you know, in many countries, um, um, the access to, to higher education uh, is still quite limited, uh, and a lot of young people cannot afford to go to college. Uh, 
so by focusing just on university students, uh, uh, some social movements uh, just overlook uh, um, the power of young people uh, who live in rural areas and small towns uh, who come from um, maybe more disadvantaged the socioeconomic backgrounds and uh, the Serbian youth movement uh, try to reach uh, this youth group uh, this youth groups, this youth demographics too, uh, through the uh, s s building a, a very extensive network of branches, uh, cells across the country. Um, and uh, uh, in 1996, 1997, uh, youth activists felt that they, they were to some extent betrayed by the opposition political parties who uh, stopped protesting once their own demands were satisfied, while university students continued to protest again uh, until the government made the concessions that were related specifically to students' rights. So, Youth activists drew a lesson from it too and uh, realized that they need to uh, maintain their independence from opposition political parties uh, and um, avoid uh, uh, the situation in which they would be just like puppet uh, of um, old god of the old uh, opposition. Very briefly, I just wanted to mention the state counter moves uh, just to illustrate how the incumbent government employed a very conventional set of measures against uh, the incumbent, uh, against the uh, youth activists in Serbia. Um, like um, in the past, uh, like in many other cases, uh, they primarily uh, try to frame uh, youth activists as a foreign mercenary, as a puppet of the West, or um, as some sort of like a terrorist radical organization. And uh, in between uh, May and um, in, uh, in for, the past, uh, for several weeks, uh, over the course of several weeks, uh, they are arrested, uh, um, according to some estimates, as many as like 2,000 poor activists and uh, fingerprinted them and tried to intimidate them. Uh, um, and, and this is one of the posters that was allegedly produced and funded by the uh, Serbian government at that time. And you can see how they used the phrase Madlen Jugend uh, to try and invoke the movement's connections uh, to both U.S. Secretary of State at that time, Madeleine Albright, and also the Nazi youth organization, Hitler Jugend. So they tried to tap uh, uh, to some extent into some anti-Nazi sentiments in the uh, Serbian society and also anti-U.S. sentiments that were very salient, very palpable, especially after the NATO bombing of Belgrade in 1999. Uh, but all these uh, state counterparts backfired, and uh, um, youth activists in Serbia uh, were able to devise uh, uh, protest tactics uh, um, that um, uh, counteracted the uh, uh, state repression. and. Uh, uh, positioned them as uh, champions of political change. Uh, so if anybody is interested to learn more about youth movements in Belarus, or in Ukraine, or in movements in Georgia and Azerbaijan, I can talk about it during the Q&A. So I'll just very really briefly conclude by pointing out the contribution to the academic literature and some takeaway, uh, takeaways for civic activists who are considering to organize um, uh, around election time. So, uh, first of all, this uh, book uh, seeks to contribute to social movement literature by um, uh, speaking to a debate about the relative importance of structure and agency. Uh, a lot of uh, political scientists, for example, would suggest that uh, the level of state repression explains uh, uh, why some social movements are able to organize and mobilize a larger number of people than other countries. And of course, state repression matters and puts significant constraints on social movements. What I try to show in the book is that um, uh, civic activists still have some uh, room for maneuvering, some choices that they need to make on how to respond to state repression or how to try and uh, counteract uh, 
um, state actions. And in addition, the project uh, speaks to, to the growing act, uh, literature on nonviolent action. Um, a lot of nonviolent action scholars uh, try to demonstrate that nonviolent works because in the past there has been a lot of criticism, a lot of skepticism about the effectiveness on nonviolent action. Uh, but they tend to focus as a result oftentimes on cases of successful nonviolent protest campaigns. And in this project, I try to look at both cases of successful and failed mobilization because I think it's very important to learn some lessons from failed mobilization. And, um, uh, you know, in Belarus to this day, since, the, since 1994, is ruled by the same person, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, uh, and uh, despite uh, some outbreaks of mass uh, protests, uh, and most recently uh, in the aftermath of the 2020 uh, presidential election, uh, he managed to survive all the um, storms uh, and uh, still uh, is in power and office. And furthermore, you know, uh, the book uh, seeks to contribute to comparative democratization literature by highlighting the role of young people. Because uh, oftentimes a lot of attention focuses on elites, on political parties, uh, uh, on um, um, uh, some uh, politicians, uh, 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 but uh, they, they tend to overlook uh, uh, the role of young people uh, in these processes. And uh, there might be a few takeaways uh, for those of you who are planning to organize uh, uh, or who are interested in doing research on uh, uh, social movements and youth activism in uh, non in repressive political regimes in particular. First of all, it's important to keep in mind that operational planning matters a great deal. Uh, when you look at protests in the street, oftentimes uh, you assume that it's all spontaneous, <laughs> that people just took to the street uh, uh, without any planning, uh, but uh, it does require a lot of strategizing. Um, and um, um, social movement is more likely to succeed if uh, uh, civic activists plan very carefully how they're going to recruit new members, how they're going to mobilize uh, support among influential allies, frame their messages in the mass media, and also how they are going to respond and deal with the state repression. For example, what they're going to do when the activists began to get arrested. Um, and uh, another takeaway is the importance of learning from previous episodes of contention inside and outside the country. I think uh, uh, if uh, we look uh, at the history of civic activism in the United States in recent years, yeah, um, after the Occupy uh, movement, uh, uh, a number of different um, uh, civic initiatives emerged, uh, and uh, some activists who were previously involved in Occupy, for example, later uh, became involved in the um, uh, BLM movement uh, or in the Me Too movement. Uh, so th 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 there is always a, uh, a lot of room for learning uh, from uh, activists inside the country, but also outside the country. Yeah? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, another important uh, lesson that needs to be kept in mind is that it's uh, critical to build a heterogeneous base of support uh, and spread beyond the capital city. And we have seen most recently, for example, during the Arab Spring in Egypt, how uh, different social forces came together uh, to uh, protest against um, uh, the incumbent uh, Hosni Mubarak. Uh, and those protests uh, saw um, in the street uh, not just college students, but also working class, you know, factory workers, and the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, they all came together. Uh, despite, uh, they, they have, uh, 
different, maybe uh, political views, different, uh, they come with, uh, from different ideological backgrounds, but they're united uh, by the hatred of the incumbent, but they desire to bring about political change. Um, and furthermore, the final takeaway that I think is very critical for young people is to make sure that youth activists cultivate a, um, a variety of uh, ties with different influential allies, but at the same time, that they maintain independence uh, from various political actors so that they are not seen as sort of like um, junior partners uh, in a particular alliance and they're able to still um, raise uh, the own uh, set of issues, uh, meant, uh, have their own agenda um, uh, in, in their interactions uh, uh, with their allies and their opponents. So. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to QA. Thank you. I don't know if you, if anyone wants to raise their hand, uh, maybe you can just introduce yourself very briefly and uh, ask a question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking me about the question about the importance of generational change. Yeah, um, I think that uh, um, generational change uh, or generational differences become more pronounced in societies that undergo very rapid uh, political change or socioeconomic change. Um, and uh, in um, the case of uh, Eastern Europe, um, differences uh, in the, the ways in which uh, young people who were born during the Soviet period were socialized and those who grew up in the post-Soviet, uh, post-communist period. So I think to some extent it did uh, have um, an impact on the ways in which young people mobilized in the post-Soviet period. Um, and uh, I think maybe to some extent, it would be fair to say that this post-Soviet generation was uh, maybe less fearful of uh, the government. <laughs> uh, because uh, I think that uh, you know, those uh, um, uh, who grew up, uh, for example, during a period of uh, very heavy-handed uh, repression you know, during the Stalin uh, period, uh, maybe um, were more fearful of the state or what it could do because uh, they witnessed themselves or they heard from their parents or grandparents about uh, the um, uh, severity of state repression uh, and those who grew up in the post-Soviet period kind of uh, were more willing to take risks but also I think more were less fearful of uh, state repression because they lived uh, for a short period of time at least um, during the period of political liberalization. In all these countries that I mentioned, uh, initially in, uh, even in Azerbaijan or in, in Ukraine or Georgia, it's in the early 1990s, there was a period of political liberalization uh, when, for example, young people were no longer required to join the Youth League of the Communist Party. <laughs> Um, when a, a multi-party political system was built. Um, so 
when there were multiple newspapers, uh, for example, on numerous TV channels. Uh, so there was like a small, a short period of time in the early 1990s when all these countries and young people who grew up there experienced uh, um, some political liberalization. And then later, uh, when those autocrats uh, rose to power, they began to curtail political freedoms uh, and roll back some democratic reforms that were launched the earlier in the early 1990s. So, so I think it, that it did have an impact uh, on young people. And also, uh, yeah, of course, uh, I think uh, some of them, uh, yeah, I mean, back at that time, uh, when I looked in the late 1990s, early 2000s, internet was not as uh, widespread and as accessible as it is now. Even cell phones were almost, you know, were very, very rarely used. Uh, um, so that's why, uh, as far as the cultivation of cross-national ties are concerned, you know, young people had to physically travel, like to a neighboring country, to meet uh, and uh, socialize uh, with each other, exchange ideas. Uh, that's why at that time, for example, there were some summer camps, uh, or there were some sessions uh, that were held in one country or another where, where they brought together young people, youth activists from different countries. And that's how they exchanged the ideas and um, share the, 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 the experiences. Yeah, it, it, nowadays, of course, it's much easier to do through telegram channels uh, uh, or through other social media platforms. Uh, as far as the definition of youth is concerned, just for the sake uh, of uh, calculating the percentages, because I've done it, you know, as, at the very beginning to try and estimate the size of the youth uh, movement in proportion to the size of the youth population. So I had to come up with some sort of working definition of youth. I, uh, I, I, th I think I looked at the age between 18 and 29. So I kind of stretched it uh, beyond 24 a little bit <laughs> until the late uh, 19, uh, uh, until the late 20s. Um, and uh, uh, it, it, the legal definition of youth varies from one country to another. Uh, and I think a lot of them actually stretch it even further into the mid-30s. <laughs> um, that's how youth is legally defined in many former Soviet republics. Uh, uh, but uh, culturally, I think that uh, um, informally, I think that, uh, you know, for, in this society, I think 30 is sort of like a big, like a threshold, yeah? Uh, once you hit 30, then you're kind of not considered uh, a young person anymore. You're expected to already uh, settle down, have a stable job, uh, you know, own some, well, get a mortgage, <laughs> settle down, get married, whatever. So I think that, you know, um, um, yeah, uh, up until um, late twenties, uh, I, I would consider it use in this in this context. Yeah, but in the project, I primarily focused on uh, university students, uh, the, the or recent university graduates, uh, um, and uh, not so much on high school students, although they would be also considered as use. These protests in the late 90s, you know, to was a structure. You know, any organization um, cannot be totally horizontal. Yeah, There's a, there should be some um, a few individuals who take key decisions. Um, but uh, in uh, the case of Otpor, for example, um, they uh, uh, created uh, a network of. Um, 
uh, sales uh, um, branches across the country and they gave uh, some autonomy to each branch to decide, for example, which protest actions they would organize. Uh, so they had some decision-making power, you know, it was not all decided in Belgrade when they should take to the street or what kind of street actions that should organize. So uh, like a lot of times uh, these young people came up with their own scripts for street performances uh, and as long as uh, the street performances uh, um, uh, were in line with the general kind of mission, with the general aim of the social movement, and uh, uh, as long as they were committed to nonviolent methods of resistance, yeah, you know, they were free to um, exercise creativity and um, um, d take initiative and organize in particular street actions. Uh, another thing that they've done was that they rotated their spokespeople every two weeks. They try to do it um, because oftentimes, if you think, for example, about political parties, yeah, they usually tend to have a, a individual who is designated as a sort of like a press secretary, as sort of like a public uh, face of a political party, and you would see um, uh, just a handful of uh, politicians who would regularly appear on the stage and would represent uh, the organization. Yeah, so they try to. Uh, show that the movement is uh, quite diverse, that it's uh, big, uh, and uh, they try to rotate spokespeople so that different uh, um, activists would uh, speak uh, uh, on behalf of the movement and would interact with um, um, journalists, for example. Yeah, um, and uh, also. Uh, to some extent, uh, you know, so some of the, yeah, and, and they also, uh, to some extent, try to disen uh, make sure that um, the movement is not associated with one particular individual. Because in uh, many post-Soviet countries, uh, to this day, the party system is very underdeveloped. And usually, a lot of political parties are even named after a particular individual. <laughs> like, for example, in Ukraine, uh, there was an um, uh, electoral bloc named Timoshenko bloc, uh, named after female politician Julia Timoshenko. Yeah? So a lot of people don't know much uh, like what that bloc stands for, but they all just associate that political force with one individual. Uh, and uh, it's very easy for um, the government or for the coercive apparatus to just discredit that individual and then uh, by default uh, decimate the full uh, movement or the, or the, the social force uh, that it represents. And that's why also they try to make sure that um, uh, they, they, uh, uh, the mo the, the, that not a single kind of like autocrat would emerge within the social movement, or not a single uh, person would uh, would be seen as a leader of the movement, uh, and that's why uh, some of them maybe deliberately stayed outside the um, public eye. So even despite the fact that maybe they have made a lot of critical decisions. Uh, uh, but they were not out there giving out media interviews every day and bragging about uh, uh, their, um, their actions. Uh, yes, yeah, so they kind of worked behind the scenes. So in a way, that, so these this are some of the things that they've done. So this is not like a theoretical definition of horizontal organizational structure, but these are some examples of how I think it played out in the real life in the case of Otpor, for example. How you can take some very small steps to just uh, uh, signal to the general public and to the rank and file members uh, that uh, their voice uh, might be heard uh, and uh, that all the power is not concentrated in the hands of a handful of movement leaders. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, yeah. I mean, and, and of course, you know, and they were open to feedback. You know, they, they, all the decisions were not made in a central way. So I think that's where the horizontal structure is, comes into play. You know, they, they, uh, it was not just one person making all the decisions. 
Um, they were open to feedback from rank and file activists. Um, uh, but at the same time, yeah, of course, you know, in any organization, there are some people who make key decisions. Uh, and it's just important how they are um, able to uh, position themselves uh, and uh, um, interact with the other stakeholders inside the movement and also uh, outside. Uh, yes? Oh. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, in, the, in the concluding section of the book, <laughs> even though I don't focus on Russia, <laughs> I do bring up Russia, uh, just because, you know, it's like an elephant in the room. Um, and uh, it's interesting uh, if, it, I, I, maybe it, it, I, I will just take a step back before answering directly your question. Um, in some cases, even when um, civic activists try to copy and borrow ideas uh, from um, uh, another country, um, just the, the, the political conditions of the ground or the political culture might not be very amenable to these ideas. Uh, and in Russia, um, the youth movement called Abarona, or Defense, was formed. So you can see again uh, the image of the clenched fist. Uh, they um, also adopted it. Uh, and uh, um, they tried, but it didn't work. It just, uh, and that's why I say that it's important to learn from previous uh, protest campaigns inside and outside the country. Uh, it's not impossible to just use a cookie cutter approach, just to take uh, some ideas that worked in a particular context, like in Serbia or in Ukraine, and uh, plan them or employ them in Russia, uh, where the political context is different in many ways. Uh, so yeah, so it did work. And uh, if you look at the post at the bottom, you can see how Navalny, when he ran, Alexei Navalny, the opposition political politician and a blogger who is currently imprisoned, um, used the phrase, Para Vigrat, <laughs> it's time to choose. So Para was the name of the Ukrainian uh, um, youth movement. And uh, it's time. Uh, uh, was uh, the slogan that uh, was uh, also used uh, in the election campaign employed by the Serbian youth movement. Uh, so uh, I think that he was familiar, or some people in his camp were familiar with the previous uh, uh, campaigns, uh, anti-government campaigns in Ukraine. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, um, uh, and uh, they, they chose this idea. Uh, um, you know, in, in Belarus, they said, had a similar slogan, "Время uh, выбирать." But it just, you know, once again, it didn't work. Uh, and uh, what worked in Russia is Nashi. <laughs> the youth movement ours uh, was formed uh, in response to the rise of anti-regime uh, youth movements in Eastern Europe. And uh, this youth movement was uh, um, designed to mobilize young people in Russia in favor of the current regime. Uh, so they uh, had some uh, street actions, like for example here, uh, the slogan at the top says, move forward uh, the Putin generation. <laughs> uh, 
uh, and uh, it was uh, organized uh, um, when Putin celebrated, I think, his, uh, uh, in, in, it was in March, uh, but uh, it was, uh, uh, they, they, urged, uh, they urged the young people to, uh, to call Putin on the cell phone or whatever, to give him some positive um, messages uh, to show their support for the government. Uh, uh, I think that uh, it's much easier, it was much easier, and maybe to this day, I think, unfortunately, as we can see most recently, it's much easier in Russia to mobilize youth around the idea of nationalism. Uh, uh, or imperialism, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, depend on how you, you can call it. Uh, of course, you would not agree with maybe with imperialism, uh, but uh, in Russia, the idea of great Russia uh, mobilizes young people much more than the idea of democratic Russia. I mean, it's uh, just, uh, it's a very unfortunate, but it's empirical fact that uh, uh, the Russian government's rhetoric appeals to a significantly larger number of people than the kind of the idea of Western liberal democracy. Um, and um, I think that without coming up with an idea, um, no matter which tactics you would use, uh, it would not work very well. Um, and uh, uh, if you, like m most recently, I mean, if you, if you they refer to post, uh, the protests that uh, broke out in Russia in uh, recent weeks after the, the draft, after the mandatory draft. Um, I, I, when I look at the pictures, uh, the images from Moscow, St. Petersburg, there were a few hundred people. A few hundred people, like, and in a city with a population like Moscow, I don't know, right now it's 10 million, 8 million? Okay, but uh, in St. Petersburg it's like 4.5, 4. yeah? Uh, so like in the city, if you're in a city of 4 million people, only 200 protests, it's very easy for the government, for the police, to just um, arrest all of them and um, crash descent it, it, because uh, um, this number does not pose any threat. It's manageable number, yeah? Um, uh, I, with all this, mo you know, with all this youth movements that were successful, they, had, they, they drew strength from numbers. Uh, in many cases, when nonviolent action works, it works because uh, citizens overpower the regime, the government, with numbers. <laughs> You know, it's easy to shoot at 100 or 200 people. You know, it's possible. I mean, unfortunately, it's possible, yeah? Uh, uh, but when, it, uh, when it's a million people in the street, uh, uh, then it becomes very problematic. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, at this point, uh, I think also, like in some other repressive political regimes, like in Belarus, for example, uh, the government provides a lot of uh, benefits for the police, for the course of apparatus. They have very high wages, relatively speaking. Uh, so they have an invested interest to maintain the status quo. And uh, um, I don't think that, uh, uh, you know, Amon in Russia has uh, uh, any incentive to step aside uh, and, uh, uh, you know, um, let, let, let uh, protesters uh, um, occupy a public space uh, in, in, I don't know, in, uh, in the city square. Uh, just, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, there, there are a lot of people right now who uh, try to draw parallels between Russia in 1917 and Russia now uh, because uh, after the Russian losses in the Russia-Japanese uh, War of 1905 and uh, the defeats in the 
First World War, a lot of soldiers uh, turned against uh, the Russian Tsar. Um, but uh, uh, right now, I don't see, uh, I, 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 well, personally, I don't see any signs uh, that uh, the Russian military uh, are ready to uh, give up on Putin. <laughs> And the security defections is another factor that plays a role in, uh, uh, that played a role, for example, in these countries. Uh, because uh, in Serbia, or in Ukraine certainly, uh, there were significant, uh, there was a significant number of people in the security apparatus, in the military, uh, who became fed up with the system and uh, were not willing to shoot at uh, p protesters. And they, they just um, signaled to the uh, ruling elite uh, that they would not follow such orders. In, in Russia, I don't, I don't uh, see any indication that they're, they're going, they are willing to defect. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I thank you for this question. Yeah, I've, very briefly, when I looked uh, at uh, this recruitment tactics of this youth movement, I noticed that in some cases, uh, um, youth activists were able to recruit a larger number of young women than others. Um, and it has to do uh, not so much with the creativity of uh, youth activists, but more with the dominant gender norms in societies in which these youth movements were formed. Um, and uh, more specifically, uh, I don't know, I just, um, uh, I don't have images of women here. <laughs> but uh, um, in the, the Republic of Georgia, uh, I interviewed actually a number of Georgian youth activists uh, who were women and who were involved uh, in uh, recruitment of youth activists uh, uh, in some information campaigns. Uh, so they were quite active. Uh, uh, they were not just rank and file members. Uh, they were also in the center of making decisions uh, um, they were, uh, and in contrast, in Azerbaijan, uh, the social norms are more conservative. Uh, fewer women were visible within the movement as a whole, and uh, uh, all the um, uh, nearly all the uh, like movement leaders whom I interviewed were men, young men. <laughs> Um, uh, and um, maybe in part it has to do with religion because um, uh, Azerbaijan is predominantly Muslim uh, society while uh, Georgia is a Christian society. Um, but uh, certainly um, there were some cross um, country differences. I think they were most pronounced in the case of uh, Azerbaijan and uh, Georgia. Um, uh, where, you know, Azerbaijan, it, it was of course not safe to get involved in a high, uh, protest against the government. Um, and um, that's why in women were in particular discouraged from attending protests uh, out of fear of state repression that they would encounter. Um, and um, uh, yeah, they, they were just um, um, not expected to show up <laughs> at such uh, events. Yeah. Well, well in, in Georgia, it seems that um, um, women have more freedom, more autonomy um, in um, deciding whether to join protests or not. Of course, although, of course, yeah, uh, it's also, it depends what is your point of reference. <laughs> because I think if you compare to Georgia to Ukraine, then Georgia it looks a little bit more conservative than Ukraine. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So I just want to officially thank Dr. Elena Nikola Yanko for joining us. Thank you. Us. <laughs>